Hello and welcome to 11FS Spotlight. Live from FinTech Nexus, formerly Blend It 2022. I am David Breer, and in this show, we shine a bit of a spotlight on the best and the brightest in the financial services and the tech industry to find a little bit more about what is it that gets them going, growing, and really what they think the future of the industry will look like. On today's spotlight, I am delighted to be joined by Terry Angelius. Is that how I say that? Angelus. So close, but like I, I apologize. Like I'm, I'm bad at, the, at these things sometimes. Uh, who is the new CEO over at Drive Wealth? Th- Terry, thank you so much for, for joining us today. I mean, I know you've got a, a really busy schedule and everything that you're doing today. So thank you very much for taking some time. Yeah, great to be here, and uh, welcome to this side of the Atlantic. I think uh, we need more 11FS folks uh, in the, in the states. Well, I think uh, a bit more caffeine, and I should be like just about lucid at this stage in terms of what we're doing. But so what we're going to be doing on this show today is talking a little bit about your career, a uh, bit more about what your new role is, uh, and really where you see the, the payments industry heading more broadly, because it's a, it's a really interesting time for everything that's happening in this space. So maybe if we start, though, what's the, what's the, the elevator pitch for, for Drive Wealth? Yeah, so um, on Friday, I was uh, working at Visa. I was uh, running FinTech and Crypto. And on Monday, I'm at this new company, Drive Wealth. Um, that must feel really weird. Was there a magnet sort of pulling yourself to the old office uh, on the Monday morning? Yeah? That, that and at, at 5 p.m. on Friday, my email stopped working at Visa. So I had, a, I had to take a break. Um, Bereft for two days, yeah. <laughs> but no, so, so Drive Wealth is um, a global FinTech infrastructure company. And they provide um, uh, API access to US equities and to digital assets like Bitcoin. You can think of it as a global investment rail on which fintechs develop their products. So companies like Cash App and Revolut and Chipper Cash and Toss, all of whom have their own fintech uh, experiences, use the Drive Wealth APIs to allow a customer to say buy $10 of Apple stock. Fantastic. I mean, that's amazing. And, you know, you, you mentioned there some humongous organizations that you guys are working with. This, this isn't a, a small startup. This is a, a real growth stage organization. Yeah. So, so the company is, is really at scale. Um, uh, one of the things that attracted me to Drive Wealth is uh, the ability to impact many of the same clients I was impacting at Visa. So if you think about my role at Visa, um, we were... Uh, effectively engaged with about a thousand fintech companies from you know, the largest ones like PayPal and, and, and TransferWise and Affirm and others to folks who were just sort of starting off creating a neobank. And all of those companies needed a global payment rail. All right? We would hope that that payment rail was default visa. We spent a lot of time creating programs to help those companies launch uh, their payment products on visa. Well, it turns out that those same class of companies, um, every neobank, every wallet, um, every um, you know, crypto exchange, uh, almost all at the same time are adding an investment button to enable their customers to uh, access US equities and crypto. Um, and Drive Wealth is the global investment rail on which many of those companies are building those products. That, that's amazing, and, and as you say, the uh, you know your previous role, your your job at, at, at Visa in that sense. I mean, the amount of change that we've seen in the industry, the rise of these types of things from a, a platform perspective. I mean, I think you were at Visa for seven years, weren't you? Before, is that is that right? Yeah, that's right. So um, actually, and my path into Visa was kind of non-traditional. I, I'd run a company. I was the co-founder and later the CEO of a company called TrialPay, which Visa was an investor in and ultimately acquired in 2015. Um, and then started focusing on fintech and later crypto, really in the last five years. Um, and in that period, we just saw a tremendous amount of change. Um, if you think about it from a Visa standpoint, and Visa has about uh, 17,000 financial institutions uh, that connect to the network. And slowly, we're getting this rotation of customers into the, this new class of client, the likes of you know, Revolut and Chime and Current and others. Um, and we had to adapt the way that we worked with those companies. Secondly, those companies are often using the network in ways that we hadn't envisioned. So if you think about some of the trends that we saw, um, you know, things like payroll used to be something that happened every two weeks. 
and was exclusively delivered via ACH uh, into my bank account. Well, now we have something like half the US population are 1099 workers, and they expect payroll to be on demand. And so Visa is one of the ways that our clients, our clients, Visa clients, would push those payments um, you know, to, those, you know, to those endpoints. That's an entirely new business use case. When you think about what's happened in the corporate card world, um, with the likes of Divi and RAM and Airbase um, uh, and, and others, you basically created this very sophisticated software layer that manages your entire corporate expense infrastructure. And oh, by the way, here's a virtual card that you use per trip so that you can um, pay for expenses all in line with your, with your corporate policies. Those are new, those are new use cases. When you think about all of the you know, digital banks, um, uh, you know, one of my favorite examples is a company called Voila out of Argentina. And one of their um, uh, most productive ads to acquire customers was simply pay for Spotify. Because if you have cash, it's really hard to like pay for your Spotify subscription or Netflix. Yeah. And so you had digital banks around the world who are bringing in people for the first time um, uh, into this kind of digital banking arena. And frankly, that's kind of sort of you know, brings me full circle. If I look about the opportunity at Drive Wealth, you know, over the last 10 years, uh, outside of China, um, there are about a billion people that now have access to a digital bank account, either through a wallet, a telco, a neobank. And those billion people have been KYC, they have a balance, uh, hopefully they have a, a car, some sort of payment rail, hopefully it's Visa. Um, and those billion people are now looking to get more from their you know, fintech partner. And one of those things is investing. So um, you know, that's where we think the opportunity is to, to access a billion people who can now uh, take that same infrastructure, that same uh, user experience, but now actually purchase, you know, five dollars of Apple stock. Yeah, it's it's amazing, isn't it? Because even some of the, the basic elements, as you say, from an India metadata around transactional people are taking those things and remixing it into a, a very different experience for customers, isn't it? How much do you think that is? I mean, financial instruments were created a hundred years ago, should we say, in terms of like lending and credit and everything that goes with that. Do you see this really as like an evolutionary step, therefore, in terms of financial services? Because customer's problem is uh, obviously very much different given the world that we live in today. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big themes of fintech is the, you know, is the famous um, sort of quote from, uh, you know, Jim Boxdale at Netscape, which is, all value is created in bundling and unbundling. And so the story of fintech really is both a bundling of services and an unbundling of services. And depending on how you look, you see both of those things happening at the same time. The first wave of fintech was about unbundling. You know, you would have like a bank that did everything. Um, you know, checking, savings, investments, maybe some sort of like, um, you know, money movement uh, services, this kind of monolithic uh, bank that provided all these services. You know, and along came, you know, uh, Cash App and said, we think we can do peer-to-peer -peer payments better, right? This tiny sliver that a bank wasn't doing well. And banks thought, okay, great, if you want to do you know, unprofitable peer-to-peer -peer money um, send, go for it. Yeah. But what they've done is, after building a really good experiencing and getting you know, over 10 million customers to adopt it, now they've added other services, and now they are rebundling things like a checking account. Um, they've added investing, actually, through DriveWell. Uh, you can purchase Bitcoin. And so now you're bundling all of these financial services back into kind of a super app or, or a financial app um, where, where your initial path was to unbundle. Yep. And so that is playing out kind of across the world. In some parts of the world, we're still unbundling. and In other parts, we're actually bundling. And it's just fascinating to watch. As, a, as an infrastructure company, as DriveWealth, we're sort of in the middle of that. In some cases, we're seeing um, you know, companies, we have a, a customer called Stake in Australia, they're kind of unbundling 
investments and they use our API. Or we're seeing a company like TOS. TOS has got you know, 28 million consumers in South Korea. They're the largest you know, financial services app. Uh, they added the Drive Wealth API. Then those customers in South Korea can now purchase shares and in you know, six months became one of the largest brokers in South Korea because they could bundle an investment product inside of their existing financial services app. So we see that happening over and over again. And I think that'll be the story for the next five or 10 years of FinTech um, uh, is, is this constant kind of push and pull as companies figure out how to, how to service customers. Yeah, I mean, that's super interesting. I completely agree with that. I um, was speaking on a panel with somebody last week, a guy called John Webster, who said uh, it's a bad time to be average. You know, actually, the, so every slice of what you've described about, they are experts at something. And actually, if you are average at a lot of things, it's not a great time to be uh, in these markets, is yeah. it? Which uh, is really exciting in that sense. I, I'm, I mean, what's it like to be a CEO again? Because, I mean, in that context, my, from my personal experience, having worked in a big corporate or starting your own business and moving, you know, being the CEO of something, and move, very different types of skill sets are required to, to do those things. Lots of convincing other people in one and lots of, you know, rolling, literally physically rolling your sleeves up and making things happen, right? So yeah. how are you finding that getting, I mean, it's a weekend, right? So it's still, still all new, but, uh, and you've got some of your colleagues here as well, so I don't want to scare them too much, but uh, how's, uh, how's the, the transition? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's so much fun to be back as a, as a CEO. Um, uh, I think there are some fun things about being in a corporate. I'll sort of start there. Um, one of the things that I think just Visa taught me is how to think about scale, how to think about long term. Sometimes in a private company, you're, you're kind of always focused on the immediate, uh, appropriately so. Um, but no, it's, it's a ton of fun. Um, you know, A, there's a learning curve. I, I have a lot to learn about, um, you know, many parts of the business. Um, but the, you know, the clock speed is just unbelievably fast and you can make decisions and you can pivot. It's probably, it's arguably the biggest advantage that uh, a small company has over a big one is just speed. Um, you know, if you're unable to move quickly and pivot, read your customers, serve them quickly, it's hard to see how a small company gets bigger. So that, that, um, that ability to be nimble, that ability to have the ability to, to change your focus uh, under some strategic sort of objective um, is a lot of fun, and 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 uh, and I'm enjoying it, and it's just great to meet you know 350 new people. Yeah, and that's that's amazing, isn't it? There's a lot of great ideas that people have that don't transpire into being a great business, but actually having a great business at scale in an international context, that's a, I mean, that's an amazing thing to achieve in that sense, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, you know. I mean, one of the things that actually might be a question for you is, um, you know, name a global fintech infrastructure company. I mean, this fintech is really interesting. Um, it's a very localized business. Um, you know, Angela Strange at Andreessen has often used this uh, analogy, which is, uh, well, Dave, what, what's the Google of Brazil? I mean, that's a stupid question, Terry. Isn't the Google of Brazil just Google? Yes because they're a global company, right? Sure. If you want to find out if it's busy at a, at a beach, you Google it in Brazil. Yeah. But what is the chase of Brazil? Right? It's not chase. It might be Nubank. And so um, FinTech is inherently local. Uh, there's local regulations. Um, there are um, uh, kind of obstacles that make accessing those markets very difficult. Um, and so how do you serve a bunch of like, localized entities? I'd argue Visa, MasterCard are global payment rails. That's pretty clear. I'd argue Stripe today is a global uh, fintech infrastructure company. They still have to get licensed in all their markets. Um, but even companies you know, like you know, Plaid and others who are as close as you might get to be an index into fintech, they generally are local, right? They may have a concentration in the US or in Europe, et cetera. One of the things we're finding and attracted me to Drive Wealth is all of the global fintech companies that we talk to, their desire is always to access US equities, right? If I were to give somebody, you know, $1,000 in Nigeria or Argentina or Thailand and they wanted to invest it, 
they would probably choose to invest in either the US dollar, US equities, or maybe crypto. And so there's this global demand for this incredible asset, which is how do I buy the S&P 500? Um, and so our goal is to be that global fintech infrastructure company. And actually, I'd be curious if you think there are others, because my, my list kind of ran short pretty quickly. Um, I just think it's very hard to be a, 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 a global infrastructure company. Yeah, I think um, my, my view on that would be, I mean, it's a completely different era now than it was when, you know, why, why did global organizations, global banks scale in a different way? It was because it was property and people. You know, that's what gave them a global presence in that sense. Whereas actually from your perspective, well, actually your code base is your code base is your code base. You know, like where you deploy it is yeah. relevant and that's relevant to your customers from a, you know, data privacy and privacy perspective in that sense. But, but actually the way in which you scale a business these days is fundamentally different in that sense. So that, that I think is the, the opportunity for businesses that are born in a, a digital world. The, the world is very much on your, your doorstep in that sense, really. I mean, Visa and MasterCard are almost by necessity, though. They're not, they're networks of networks, really, aren't they? In that sense, the, the payment rails, because out of necessity, joining all of those different regulatory, uh, you know, control frameworks together was a requirement to scale in that sense, as well as the people in the, the property piece that kind of went with it. So, you know, 20 years ago, it would be so hard to do what you guys are doing. Like, the, the advancements that we've seen today make all of this really possible, which is, you know, we say it's the best time to be doing what we're doing, right? It's, uh, you know, thank God we work in financial services in 2022 and not, you know, 1822. It would be uh, nowhere near as fun, would it? <laughs> yes, we'd have to deal with, like, the stagecoach or something. Exactly. Different problems, still, still bad actors in certain senses in that sense, but... Uh, so, I mean, what, what's next for DriveWells? So obviously, look, you, you joined the company, you know, knowing you, knowing your aspirations, this isn't just to, to keep the plate spinning. You know, there's a, it's a big world, the, the sort of the embedded side of this and everything that's really sort of emerging. There is huge amounts of global opportunity there. So, what's next? You know, I think on the, on the roadmap, you know, what, one thing we've announced is, is crypto. So, um, you know, many of our clients um, really view investing as... Uh, a, a regulated rail into a number of different asset classes. Uh, could be single stocks, could be um, uh, you know, indices, could be uh, bonds, but could also be crypto. So, so that's coming online um, uh, and excited to, to add that to, to, to our clients. But I think if you go sort of beyond the, you know, the roadmap, um, the opportunity for us and the challenge for us uh, is to become that that global rail, um, so that uh, wherever you are in the world, if you um, want to provide this functionality, and, and it turns out that every neobank sort of got the memo at the same time. Everyone's adding the investment button, you know, in 22 and 23. So, you know, our goal is to make sure that that investment button is powered by Drive Wealth. You know, beyond that, if you think about the opportunity today, you know, I don't know of a company that would have, again, our goal is to access these, 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 these billion consumers. If you're reaching tens of millions or hundreds of millions of consumers, retail consumers, one of the questions we have are, what are the products that that class of customer wants that doesn't have today? And that's probably the most exciting thing for us. If I go back to my Visa example, you know, Visa is not the company that invented early wage access. We're not the company that, you know, um, figured out how to embed virtual cards into software. Those were very smart, very well-run fintech companies building on top of that payment rail. I think for us, success will be when those same smart companies develop new products that we haven't thought about on top of our investment rail. And there's so many things you can do. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, you know, the traditional way to think about investing is to start with equities and then add options, right? When's the last time you, as a sophisticated fintech person, like, executed an option? Like, right? This is for a very small sort of, hand, uh, uh, you, know, a, you know, a small set of customers. I think we want to do things like ask people, hey, David, you have a lot of concentration in Google stock. On a scale of one to 10, how would you feel if the stock doubled? Sure. All right, I feel very happy, maybe an eight. 
how, how sad would you feel if the stock price halved? Oh, I'd feel terrible. Like, I, it's zero. Well, it turns out you might want some insurance. I mean, given the market, that's actually pretty close to the bone right now. There we go. I'm quite <laughs> sensitive about it right now, but yeah. How no. much further could it go down? <laughs> um, but really, that, you know, that's an option which I think most of our customers would experience as an insurance product. Yeah. Those are some of the super exciting products that I think will be built on the platform once clients have this regulated pipe through drive wealth into, you know, into the US stock market. Yeah, we had um, did one of these interviews earlier on with uh, Tui Allen, who's the leader of product for Shopify. And it's amazing in that sense that you solve one problem for a consumer, very often it pops up two or three more problems and, and, and that's how they were sort of seeing it. I, I think there is gonna be so much auxiliary opportunity in that sense in terms of what you guys are doing, which is amazing. But we're, we're rapidly running out of time though. We are gonna have to uh, uh, wrap things up. We always like to sort of leave with a, um, you know, you've had an amazing career, you've done amazing different things, you're doing amazing things now, which is fantastic. But uh, I mean, how much of this is, um, I always say like, I'd say 99% of my career is luck over judgment in that sense. Uh, and to that point, what would you, what advice would you give somebody who's getting into this industry? Yeah, I mean, I think there are sort of, you know, two universal things that you can never go wrong, which is one is surround yourself with great people, people who are smarter than you, people who um, think differently than you. And usually those people are excited to share what they know. This is what, you know, this is my, my, my favorite description of 11FS is just, you're like a nerd radar, right? It's just, it's a bunch of people who just want to talk payments all day, that, and that, that's that wonderful. Was bizarrely our second choice for the name of the company, actually, Nerd, nerd radar. radar. We should trademark that straight away, but. So, um, so surround yourself with excellent people. Um, and then I think just um, think long-term. You know, early on in your career, you're so impatient to get something done. Uh, I think if you can compound the people and the knowledge over the long term, um, it's, it actually is astoundingly easy to become an expert if you just spend a little time learning and allow that to compound. So that, you know, that would be um, advice that I, that I would uh, you know, apply to myself uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Definitely. I mean, patience is a bizarrely lacking thing sometimes in that sense, isn't it? And it's a hard learned skill sometimes in that, that way. I, I, I feel that firsthand in terms of many roles that I've been in. But uh, all right, Terry, well, on that note, thank you so much for spending the time with us. And where can people learn a little bit more about you uh, and a little bit more about the company? Yeah, uh, just go to drivewealth.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at uh, Terry Angelos and uh, look forward to hosting you in California sometime. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. Anywhere it's sunny and sh like lovely, I'm, I'm all good to be there for that one. So, all right, guys, on that note, we have run out of time. So thank you very much for joining us. If you like what you've seen, then subscribe to, I mean, this YouTube channel, the podcast. Find us on pretty much every social media channel at the stage in, the, in every sense of the world uh, in terms of what 11FS is doing. Uh, if you have liked this one, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel where every other episode of this podcast is there as well. But sadly, that's all the time that we have for you today. Thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you.